from Santa Clara, California, in the heart of Silicon Valley, it's The Cube, covering Altitude 2020. Brought to you by Aviatrix. Our next customer panel, we've got great, another set of cloud network architects, Justin Smith with Zora, Justin Broadley with Ellie May, and Amit Otrija with Coupa. Welcome to stage. All right, thank you. How are you? Thank you, thank you. Hey, Mitch, that's it, how are you? Okay, did he, did he say it right? Yeah. <laughs> okay, he's got all the, the cliff notes from the last session. Yeah. Welcome back. R rinse and repeat. Yeah. yeah. No, we're going to go under the hood a little bit. I think, I think they nailed the, um, what we've been reporting and we've been having this conversation around. Networking is where the action is because that's the end of the day. You got to move a packet from A to B and you got workloads exchanging data. So it's really killer. So let's get started. Uh, I mean, what are you seeing as the journey of, of multi-cloud? As you go under the hood and say, okay, I got to implement this. I have to engineer the network, make it enabling, make it programmable, make it interoperable across clouds. I mean, that's like, I mean, almost sounds impossible to me. What's your take? Yeah, I mean, it, it seems impossible, but if you are running an organization which is in running infrastructure as a code, and it, it is easily doable. Like you can use tools out there that's available today. You can use third-party products that can do a better job. But, but put your architecture first. Don't wait, architecture may not be perfect. Put the best architecture that's available today <coughs> and be agile to iterate and um, make improvements over the time. We got two Justins over here, so I have to be careful when I point a question to Justin. <laughs> they both have to answer. But okay, journeys, what's the journey been like? I mean, is there phases? We heard that from Gardner. Uh, people come into multi-cloud and cloud native networking from different perspectives. What's your take on the journey, Justin? Yeah, I mean, from our perspective, we started out very much focused on one cloud. Uh, and as we started doing acquisitions, we started doing new uh, per products in the market, the need for multi-cloud becomes very apparent very quickly for us. And so, you know, having an architecture that we can plug and play into and be able to add and change things as it changes is super important for what we're doing in the space. Just in your journey? Yeah, so, so for us, um, we were very ad hoc oriented. Um, and the idea is that we were reinventing all the time, trying to move into these new things and coming up with great new ideas. And so rather than it being some iterative approach with our deployments that became a number of different deployments. Um, and so we shifted that toward, and the network has been a real enabler of this, is that it, there's one network and it touches whatever cloud we want it to touch, and it touches the data centers that we need it to touch, and it touches the customers that we need it to touch. Our job is to make sure that the services that are available in one of those locations are available in all of the locations. So the idea is not that we need to come up with this new solution every time, it's that we're just iterating on what we've already decided to do. Before we get to the architecture section, I want to ask you guys a question. I'm a big fan of, you know, let the app developers have infrastructure as code, so check. But having the right cloud run that workload, I'm a big fan of that if it works, great. But we just heard from the other panel, you can't change the network. So I want to get your thoughts. What is cloud native networking? And is that the engine really that's the enabler for this multi-cloud trend? What's you guys take on? We'll start with Amit. What do you think about that? Yeah, so you are going to have workloads running in different clouds. And the workloads would have affinity to one cloud over other. But how you expose that, it's a matter of how you are going to build your networks, how you are going to run security, how you are going to do egress, ingress out of it. So you said networking is the big problem to yes. solve. Mm -hmm. yeah. How do you, what's the, what's the solution? What's the, end, the key uh, pain points and problem statement? I mean, the key, the key pain point for most companies is how do you take your traditionally on-premise network and then blow that out to the cloud in a way that makes sense. You know, IP conflicts, you have IP space, you have public IPs on-premise as well as in the cloud, and how do you kind of make a, me a sense of all of that? And I think that's where tools like Aviatrix make a lot of sense in that space. From our side, it's, it's really simple. It's latency, it's bandwidth, and availability. Um, these don't change whether we're talking about cloud or data center or even corporate IT networking. <clears throat> so our job, when, when these all, all of these things are simplified into like S3, for instance, and our developers want to use those, we have to be able to deliver that and for, the, for a particular group or another group that wants to use just just GCP resources. Um, these aren't, th we have to support these re requirements and these wants as opposed to saying, hey, that's not a good idea. No, our job is to enable them, not to disable them. Do you think guys, do you guys think infrastructure as code, which I love that, I think it's, that's the future it is. We saw that with DevOps. But as you start getting into networking, is it getting down to the network portion where it's network as code? Because storage and compute working really well, you're seeing all Kubernetes and service mesh trend. Network as code. 
Reality? Is it there? Is it still got work to no, do? It's absolutely there. I mean, you mentioned Net DevOps, and it's, it's very real. I mean, in Coupa, we build our networks through Terraform, and on, on not only just Terraform, build an API so that we can consistently build VNets and VPC all across in the same way. So you guys are and, doing it? Yeah, and even security groups. And then on top, when Aviatrix comes in, we can peer the networks, bridge, bridge all the different regions through uh, code. Same for you guys, what yeah, do you think about this? Everything we deploy is done with automation. Um, and then we also run uh, things like Lambda on top to, to make changes in real time. Uh, we don't make manual changes on our network. Uh, in the data center, funny enough, it's still manual. Um, but the cloud has enabled us to move into this automation mindset. And, and all my guys, that's what they focus on, is, is bringing now what they're doing in the cloud into the data center, which is kind of opposite <laughs> of what it should be. So it's full or DevOps. what it used to be. It's full DevOps then. Yes. Yeah, I mean, for us, it was similar. Uh, On-prem is still somewhat very manual, although we're moving more and more to Ninja and, and Terraform type concepts. Uh, but everything in the production environment is, is code, cloud formation, Terraform code, and now coming into the data center at the same time. I just wanted to jump in on uh, Justin Smith, one of the comments that you made, because that's something that we always talk about a lot, is that the center of gravity of architecture used to be an on-prem, yep. and now it's shifted into cloud. And once you have your strategic architecture, what, you, what do you do? You push that everywhere. So what you used to see at the beginning of cloud was pushing the architecture on-prem into cloud. <laughs> now, I want to pick up on what you said. Do you others agree? that the center of architect of, of gravity is here. I'm now pushing what I do in the cloud back into on-prem. Mm -hmm. and, and then so first that, and then also in the journey, where are you at from zero to 100 of, of actually in the journey to cloud? Do you, are you 50% there? Are you 10%? <clears throat> yeah, so I mean. Are you evacuating data centers next year? I mean, where, where are you guys at? Yeah, so there's, there's two types of gravity that you typically are dealing with in a migration. First is data gravity and your data set and where that data lives. And then the second is the network platform that interrupts right. all that together. Right. Um, in our case, uh, the data gravity is still mostly on-prem, but our network is now extending out to the app tier that's going to be in cloud. Right. Eventually, that data gravity will also move to cloud as we start getting more sophisticated. But you know, on our journey, we're about halfway there. Okay. We're about halfway through the process. We're taking a handle of you know, lift and shift. And, and when did that start? We started about three years ago. Okay. Okay. Well, for Coupa, it's a very different story. <laughs> it started from a garage and 100% on the cloud. So it's a yeah. business spend management platform as a software as a service run 100% on the cloud. That was like 10 years ago, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. You guys are riding the wave. Love the yeah. architecture. Yeah. Justin, I want to ask you, Zora, you guys mentioned DevOps. I mean, obviously, we saw the huge observability wave which is essentially network management for the cloud, in my opinion. Right, right. But, you know, it's more dynamic, but this is about visibility. We heard from the last panel, you don't know what's being turned on or turned off from a services standpoint at any given time. How is all this playing out when you start getting into the DevOps down? Well, this, layer? this is the big challenge for all of us is visibility um, when, when you talk transport within a cloud. Um, you know, we, very interestingly, we, have moved from having a backbone that we bought, that we own, that would be data center connectivity. We now, I work for, Zora is a subscription billing company, so we want to support the subscription mindset. So rather than going and, and buying circuits and having to wait three months to install and then coming up with some way to get things connected and resiliency and redundancy, I, my backbone is in the cloud. I, I use the cloud providers' interconnections between regions to transport data across. And, and so if you do that with their native solutions, you, you do lose visibility. There, there are areas in that that you don't get, which is why controlling you know, controllers and having some type of management plane is a requirement for us to do what we're supposed to do and provide consistency while doing it. A great conversation. I loved what you said earlier, latency, bandwidth, I think availability were your Simple. top three things. Yep. Guys, SLA, I mean, you just do ping times between clouds. It's like, you don't know what you're getting for uh, round trip times. This becomes a huge kind of risk management, black hole, whatever you want to call blind spot. How are you guys looking at the interconnects between clouds? Because, you know, I can see that working from, you know, ground to cloud on per cloud, but when you start dealing with multi-clouds workloads, I mean, SLAs will be all over the map, won't they just inherently? But how do you guys view that? Yeah, I think we, we, we talked about workload and we know that the workloads are going to be different in different clouds, but they're going to be calling each other. So it's very important to have that visibility that you can see how data is flowing at what latency and what availability is, our, is there and our SRE team needs to operate on that. So it's, it's so really key. So use the software, dashboard, look at 
the times and look at the latency. In the old days, strong swan, open swan, you try to figure it out. In the new <laughs> days, you have to figure out. Justin, what's your answer to that? Because you're in the middle of it. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the key thing there is that we have to plan for that failure. We have to plan for that latency in our applications. It's something you start tracking in your SLI, something you start planning for, and you loosely couple these services in a much more microservices approach. So you actually can handle that kind of failure or that type of unknown latency. And unfortunately, the cloud has made us much better at handling uh, exceptions in a much better way. You guys are all great examples of cloud native from day one. I mean, you guys had the, when did you have the tipping point moment or the epiphany of saying, hey, multi-cloud's real, I can't ignore it. I got to factor it into all my design, design principles and, and everything you're doing. What's, was there a moment or was it, was it from day one? No, there were two, two reasons. One was the business. So in business, there was some affinity to not be in one cloud or to be in one cloud, and that drove from the business side. So as a cloud architect, our responsibility was to support that business. And other is the technology. Some things are really running better in, like if you're running .NET workload, or you're going to run machine learning or AI. So, so the, you, have, you would have that preference of one cloud over other. So, guys, any thoughts on that? That was the bill that we got from AWS. I mean, that's that's what drives <laughs> a lot of these conversations is the financial viability of of what you're building on top of, um, it, which is so we this failure domain idea, which is which is fairly interesting. How do how do I solve or guarantee um, against a failure domain? You have methodologies with. Um, you know, backend direct connects or interconnect with GCP. All of these ideas are, are something that you have to take into account, but that transport layer should not matter to whoever we're building this for. Our job is to deliver the frames and the packets. Um, what that flows across, how you get there, we want to make that seamless. And so whether it's a public internet API call or it's a backend connectivity through direct connect, it doesn't matter. It just has to meet a contract that you've signed with your application folks. Yeah, that's the availability piece. Justin, your thoughts on that? Any, any comment on that? Uh, so actually, multi-cloud has become something much more recent in the last six to eight months, I'd say. Uh, we always kind of had a very much an attitude of like, moving to Amazon from our private cloud is hard enough. Why complicate it further? Uh, but the realities of the business, and as we start seeing you know, improvements in Google and Azure and different technology spaces, the need for multi-cloud becomes much more important, as well as as our acquisition strategies have matured, we're seeing that companies that used to be on-premise that we typically acquire are now very much already on a cloud. And if they're on a cloud, I now need to plug them into our ecosystem, and so yeah. that's really changed our multi-cloud uh, story in a big way. I'd love to get your thoughts on the clouds versus the clouds, because you know you compare them, Amazon's got more features, they're rich with features, obviously you know, the bills are high for people using them, but Google's got a great network, right? I mean, Google's network's pretty damn good. And then you got uh, Azure. What's the difference between the clouds? Who, where do they fall? Some, they, where they peak in certain areas better than others? What are, what are the uh, characteristics? Which makes one cloud better? Do they have a unique feature that makes Azure better uh, than Google and vice versa? What do you guys think about the different clouds? Yeah, to my experience, I think uh, there is the approach is different in many places. Um, Google has a different approach, very DevOps friendly, and you can run your workload, like the, the, your network can span regions. Then. I mean, so, but our application ready to accept that. Uh, Amazon is evolving. I mean, I remember 10 years back, Amazon's network was a flat network. We would be <laughs> launching servers in 10.0.0 slash 8, right? And, <laughs> and the, then VPC Could've came out. In English for the live feed. <laughs> 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 Not good. So, so the VPC concept came out, multi-account came out. So they are evolving. Azure had a late start, but because they have a late start, they saw the pattern and they, they have some mature set up on the network. They allow sales yeah. guys too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think they're all trying to say they're equal in their own ways. Um, I think they all have very specific design philosophies uh, that allow them to be successful in different ways, and you have to kind of keep that in mind as you architect your own solution. For example, Amazon has a very much a very regional affinity. They don't like to go cross-region in their architecture, uh, whereas Google is very much it's a global network we're going to think about as a global solution. Um, I think Google also has the advantage that it's third to market, and so it has seen what Azure did wrong, it's seen what AWS did wrong, and it's made those improvements, and I think that's one of their big advantages. They got great right scale, too. Justin, thoughts on the cloud? Yeah, so, yeah, Amazon built from the system up, and Google built from the network down. Um, so their ideas and approaches are, are from a global versus a regional. I agree with you completely. That, that, that is the big number one thing. Um, but the, if you look at it from the outset, um, interestingly, the the inability or the ability for Amazon to limit layer two broadcasting and, and what that really means from a VPC perspective changed all the routing protocols you can use, all the things that we have built inside of a data center to, to provide resiliency and, and, and make things seamless to users, all of that disappeared. Um, and so 
because we had to accept that at the VPC level, now we have to accept it at the WAN level. Google's done a better job of being able to overcome those things and provide those traditional network facilities to us. Uh, it's just a great panel, I can go all day here, it's awesome. So I heard, um, we go, we'll get to the cloud native naive question, so kind of think about what's naive and what's cloud, I'll ask that next. But I got to ask you, I had a conversation with a friend, he's like, the WAN is the new LAN. So if you think about what the LAN was at a data center, yeah. WAN is the new LAN, because you're talking about the cloud impact. So that means SD-WAN, the old SD-WAN is kind of changing <coughs> to the new LAN. How do you guys look at that? Because if you think about it, what LANs were for inside of premises was all about networking, <laughs> high speed. But now when you take the WAN and make it essentially a LAN, do you agree with that? And how do you view this trend? And uh, is it good or bad or, or is it ugly? And what's, what's your guys' take on this? Yeah, I think it's a, it, it, it's a thing that you have to work with your application architect. So if you are managing networks and if you are a SRE engineer, you need to work with them to expose the unreliability that would bring in. So the application has to handle a lot of this, um, the difference in the latencies and, uh, and the reliability has to be worked through the application there. Land, WAN, same concept as a BS. <laughs> uh, I mean, I think same. we've been talking about for a long time the erosion of the edge. And so is, this is just a continuation of that journey we've been on for the last several years. As we get more and more cloud native and we talk about APIs, the, the ability to lock my data in a place and not be able to access it really goes away. And so I think this is just a continuation of that thing. I think it has challenges. We start talking about WAN scale versus LAN scale. The tooling doesn't work the same. The scale of that tooling is much larger. Uh, and the need to automation is much, much higher in a WAN than it was in a LAN. That's the reason why you're seeing so much infrastructure as code. Yeah. Yeah, so for me, I'll go back again to this. Uh, it's bandwidth and it's latency, right, that, that define those two um, LAN versus WAN. But the other thing that comes up more and more with cloud deployments is where is our security boundary? And where can I extend this uh, secure, aware appliance or set of rules to, to, to protect what's inside of it? Um, so for us, we're, we're able to deliver VRFs or, or route forwarding tables for different segments wherever we're at in the world. And so they're, they're trusted to talk to each other, but if they're gonna go to some place that's outside of their, their network, then they have to cross a security boundary and where we enforce policy very heavily. Yeah. So, so for me, there's, it's not just land WAN, it's, it's how does environment get to environment, more yeah. importantly. That's a great point, and security we haven't talked to yet, but that's gotta be baked in from the beginning, this architecture, thoughts on security, how you guys are dealing with it. Yeah, start from the base, uh, have app to app security built in, have TLS, have encryption on the data at transit, data at rest, but as you bring the application to the cloud and they're gonna go multi-cloud, talking to o over the internet in some places, well, have app to app security. I mean, that's as simple. I mean, our principle is day, security is day zero every day. And so yeah. we, we always build it into our design, build it into our architecture, into our applications, it's encrypt everything, it's TLS everywhere. It's make sure that that data is secured at all times. Yeah, one of the cool trends at RSA, just as a side note, was the data in use mm -hmm. encryption piece, which is the homomorphic stuff, is pretty oh, yeah. interesting yeah. stuff. All right, guys, final question. You know, we heard on the earlier panel was also trending at reInvent. If you take the T out of cloud native, it spells cloud naive. Okay, they got shirts now, Aviatrix kind of got this trend going. What does that mean to be naive? So if you're uh, to your peers out there watching on the live stream and also the suppliers that are trying to you know, supply you guys with technology and services. What's naive look like and what's native look like? When, when is someone naive about implementing all this stuff? So for me, because we are in 100% cloud, for us, its main thing is ready for the change. And you will, you will find new building blocks coming in <laughs> and the network design will evolve and change. So don't be naive and think that it's static. Evolve with the change. I think the big naivety that people have is that, well, I've been doing it this way for 20 years and been successful. It's going to be successful in cloud. The reality is that's not the case. You have to think some of the stuff a little bit differently and you need to think about it early enough so that you can become cloud native and really enable your business on cloud. Yeah, for me, it's, uh, it's being open-minded, right? The, the, our industry, the network industry as a whole, um, has been very much, I'm smarter than everybody else and we're going to tell everybody how it's going to be done. Um, and we, ha we, we fell into a lull when it came to producing infrastructure. And, and, and so embracing this idea that we can deploy a new solution or a new environment in minutes as opposed to hours or weeks or, or months in some cases is really important. And, and so, you know. So naive being closed-minded, native being open-minded. Exactly. And, and 
it, it took a, for me it was, that, that was a transformative kind of, uh, where I was looking to solve problems in a cloud way as opposed to looking to solve problems in this traditional old school way. All right, well, I know we're out of time, but I asked one more question, so you guys are so good. It could be a quick answer. Um, what's the BS language when you, the BS meter goes off when people talk to you about solutions? What's the kind of <laughs> jargon that you hear? That's the BS meter going off. What are people talking about that, in your opinion, you hear and you go, that's total BS. What, what triggers you? So, so the, I have two lines out of movies that are really, that I can, if, the, if I say them without actually thinking them. Uh, it's like 1.21 gigawatts, oh, you're out of your mind from Back to the Future, right? Somebody's giving you all these biz, biz bank things. And then, uh, and then Martin Mull and, and uh, Michael Keaton and Mr. Mom when he goes 220, 221, whatever it takes. Yeah. Those two right there, if those go off in my mind as somebody's talking to me, I know they're full of baloney. Yeah. <laughs> so a lot of speeds and feeds, a lot of speeds and feeds, a lot yeah, of- Yeah, just data, just, it, it, instead of talking about what you're actually doing and solutioning, for, you're talking about, well, it does this, 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 and this. Okay, 220, 221, yeah, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we got that. Justin, what's your take? Uh, anytime I start seeing the cloud vendors start benchmarking against each other, it's yeah. your workload is your workload. You need to benchmark yourself. Don't don't listen to the marketing on that. That's that's just all. And then what triggers you on the BS meeting? I think if somebody explains you and not simple, they cannot explain you in simplicity, then, then it's all bullshit. <laughs> well, sound, <laughs> that's a good one. <laughs> all right, guys, thanks for the great insight, great panel. How about a round of applause? practitioners. Yes, yes, yes.